today we're going to transition over to the next uh, topic in Joshua, which is going to be in Joshua chapter 2. So if you want to go there, I will eventually meet up with you a little bit later on. But I want to give you first a little science lesson. I am not strong in science. It was one of the areas that I was always counting on that last quiz or last test at the end of the quarter to get me above the 60% mark sometimes or the 70% mark or whatever, whatever it was. So science was not my strength. But I noticed that there was an interesting tie-in for the message this week, and that's the scientific concept of what's called the melting point. If you don't know this, Everything has a melting point. It has a temperature that if you get it to that temperature, it will, it will begin to melt. It will become malleable. It will, whatever it may be. Some things obviously have a lower melting point than other things, like a candle has a very low melting point. It'll melt pretty quickly if you put a flame to it. And there's other things that take a lot of energy, a lot of heat to get it to melt down. And on a scientific level, what's actually happening is that everything around us is made up of atoms and particles, and they are stuck in relationship to one another. And they will stay in that position and in that relationship until there's enough energy that's transferred to these particles by way of heat to get them to the point where they're able to break free from that connection to the other particles around. And that's what heat does. Heat energizes these particles, and then finally they're like, all right, peace out, I'm going to do my own thing. And they just break apart from each other, and that's why something melts, is now the particles are free to move around. And today in Scripture, I want to look at three different instances, three different times in the book of Joshua and the book of Deuteronomy just before that, where people in people groups reach their melting point. Did you know that you and I have a melting point as well? I'm not talking about our physical body, which as nasty as it sounds, it probably does have a melting point as well, but I'm talking about the internal there's something internal within us that has a melting point, and that melting point can be reached. And typically what pushes us to the melting point is fear. Fear is what will push us to the melting point. And sometimes it's actually a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. And we're going to see examples of both today. So we're going to start actually in Deuteronomy chapter 1. You can stay in Joshua 2 if you're there, but I'm going to tell you the story of 12 spies that are sent into the promised land. I know I've referenced this before in previous sermons in this series because if th this event, what happens here, what Moses commissions, plays a significant role in the rest of what happens all the way through not only Moses' ministry but also uh, Joshua's ministry and, and going into the promised land. But essentially... Moses tells 12, 12, uh, all the tribes of Israel to pick one person, and each person is going to come together, totaling 12, and they are going to journey into the promised land to spy it out and see what it looks like, what challenges lay be, be uh, ahead of them, and what kind of agriculture is in the land. What are they supposed to get excited about? You know, It's like if you're going to go on vacation, I don't know if you guys do this, but I look up photos of the hotel before I ever get on the flight because that's what gets me excited because I look at what the hotel looks like, especially when I was younger. You always look at the, the pictures of the pool. I, I look at it all the time. Like the pictures would never change, but I just kept looking up the pictures because like that's what I'm getting excited about. So anyways, these spies are going into the land to figure out what are we there? To, what are we getting excited about? What are, we, what are we trying to expect? And so they go, they go on their journey, they come back, and they give a report to the people of Israel. And in Deuteronomy chapter 1, this is not the actual report itself. This is now Moses retelling the story of what happened in that instance. So he's retelling the story, and this is what he says about their attitude when they came back and they gave their report to the rest of Israel. He says, starting in verse 26, But you are unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, The Lord hates us, so he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers, meaning the spies, 
have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. So what happened was these 12 spies, they came back, and the report they gave to Israel was a discouraging report. They said, as is mentioned by Moses, the walls are to the sky, the people are bigger than we are, and we're going to get crushed if we go and try to take the land. So the first thing that we see right here, the first melting point that is reached, is the people of Israel are melting in fear because we melt in fear when we think that God is against us. We melt in fear when we think that God is against us. How did they get to a place, the Israelite people, where they believed that God hated them? Where they believed that this was essentially a whole simulation of God to get them out into the wilderness just to kill them there. That's essentially what they thought God was, was doing to them. Like it was some kind of sick game that God had played on them that was going to result in their death. They had traveled under God's miraculous provision and grace for 40 years before this happened. 40 years they saw God's miraculous provision in the wilderness. I've mentioned the list before, but it's worth repeating. They had manna from heaven. They had water coming out of rocks. They had supernatural guidance by way of of a pillar of smoke by day and fire by night. They had the tabernacle with them, God's manifest presence traveling with them. He would send a a swath of, of quail so they could taste meat and not just bread. God was miraculously blessing them the whole time. It even says in Scripture that their clothes did not wear out the entire time that they traveled. God supernaturally prevented their clothes from natural wear and tear from the journey. This is the kind of grace that they were walking in. And now they're at a place, after seeing all that, after being under that for so long, where they think that God hates them and God is against them. How do you get to this place? The scary part is you and I are just as vulnerable as the Israelites. You and I are just as vulnerable to get to a place like this if we don't protect one specific part of our heart. The chief thing that they did wrong, where they went wrong, is that they lacked faith. It's so elementary, it's so basic, but we can't afford to overlook it. They lacked faith. And here's the thing is when you don't have faith, your picture of God will always be incomplete. You can never have a full picture of God without faith because faith is actually what completes our image of who God is. All the way into the New Testament, we have the Hebrew letter. And the writer of the Hebrews references this rebellion of the Israelite people, references their, in, uh, their unwillingness to go into the promised land because of what they saw. And this is what the Hebrew writer says in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest or the promised land still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. So I'm going to stop there for a second. The Hebrew writer Hundreds of years later is warning them, be careful not to do what they did. Again, we are just as susceptible today as they were. He, uh, the, the writer continues on. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was, was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. So the reason why they were not able to see what Joshua and Caleb were able to see in the promised land because they came back and said, guys, we can take this land because God is with us. That was their perspective because they had the perspective of faith. But the rest of the spies, the 10 of the spies, which then spread to the, the entire people of Israel because they did not have faith, because they had fear instead, it led to a fractured and incomplete view of who God was. And this is what fear does to us. This is what a lack of faith, or in other words, fear does, is it distorts 
Even if you look at the language that they used when they gave their report, when they came back, the 10 that, were, that gave a negative report, they said the people are stronger and taller than us. They use exaggerated language. And this is the most exaggerated. They said there's walls up to the sky. Did you know that ancient walls, believe it or not, were actually not that high? Like they didn't, ha- they didn't have the ability to build these massive walls. They just didn't have the ability to do it. The walls were not that high. But when you have fear, fear distorts. And so you get an exaggerated account of what happened. Walls up to the sky. This is what fear does to us. Fear distorts while faith actually brings clarity instead. And so the warning for us today is to be careful to draw conclusions based on what you see. Your sight is a gift from God, but it can become a curse really quick when you let it guide your faith. And that's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we live by faith, not by sight. You can use your sight, but you're not allowed to live your life by it. It cannot be what dictates your faith. It is not determined by what you see. It's determined by what God said. And what God said to them is, I am with you and I will give you success when you go into the promised land. It doesn't mean that what you saw is not true or not accurate. Yes, there's people there. Yes, they are ready to fight. Yes, they are ready to push back against you. That is not false. But what is true is that I have said that I will be with you and sometimes that i think we let our our sight get in the way and begin to dictate our faith is what happens when prayers go unanswered in our lives what happens when prayers are not answered according to our timelines when we want to see them answered you know what begins to happen fear begins to creep in and all of a sudden we begin to think god must not love me god must be against me Uh, God must not want me to have this now. All of a sudden, you see how quickly you begin, begin to think that God could possibly be against you. It happens way quicker than we realize. Sometimes a life gets difficult, and then it gets more difficult. And we're like, what the heck is going on? And sometimes we begin to creep over to this conclusion, well, maybe God might be against me right now. Maybe God might be doing all this to me. When anything happens in our life that doesn't line up with, with what we should believe in, in faith, we have to avoid the temptation to assume that all of a sudden God may somehow be our enemy. That is not the logical conclusion of faith. God is not your enemy. I'm going to read this lengthy passage, but I think this is worth emphasizing. Romans 8, 31 to 39 This is what Paul says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? I think we can add in or prayers that haven't been answered in the time that we think they should be answered in. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What's the conclusion of Paul? Nothing can separate us from God's favor. Nothing can separate us from God's love. So no matter what happens in your life, the response that God must be against me will never line up with Scripture. It'll never line up with faith. It's never going to be logical. So we get back to the book of Joshua now, and something interesting happens is that Joshua decides that he's going to send spies into the promised land, just like Moses did. But for him... And I'm not really sure if there's anything behind this. I don't want to extrapolate all this stuff out of Scripture that's just not there. But Joshua, he only sends two spies into the land. And I wonder if he's like, you know, 
I think we had too many cooks in the kitchen last time when we had 12 people going into the promised land, all seeing this stuff, and 10 of them came back with a negative report. I'm just going to send two in because apparently two is all we need to get a report of faith to come back with. So he sends them into the land. And they end up in the household of a woman by the name of Rahab. And they're going to stay there for the night. And once they get into Rahab's home, uh, the king of Jericho finds out that there are spies from Israel. They know right away somehow. I'm not sure if they had, you know, shirts on that said like spy. You know, the police badges just says spies on it. They knew right away. So they came to Rahab and they're like, hey, bring these spies out. We, we know what they're doing here. And Rahab, without the spies asking her to do this or giving her the idea or anything, she decides that she's going to lie to the king of Jericho and tell them the spies have already left. They've, they've gone. If you want to catch them, you're going to have to take this route. And she misleads them in the total wrong direction. And so while she's doing that, the spies go up, and, and it looks like they're sleeping on the roof. And they get ready. They get tucked in for bed. And just before they fell into a deep sleep, don't you love it when somebody wakes you up? And that's what Rahab did. She comes up, and she wakes them up. And it says, uh, she says to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. This is in Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. She goes on to say, We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sidon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Can I give you some good news? The enemy melted in fear, awaiting their destruction. I want you to see something really cool here in Scripture that I think is going to encourage you. Did you know that the enemy is always in a position to be defeated by God? I want you to think about that. The enemy is always in a position to be defeated by God. Do you know, we all know somebody who is injury-prone, who's always prone to have those ridiculous accidents happen to them. At youth group, there's always a kid that just is always getting hit in the face with a ball. Like that is, it, the ball will always find their face in dodgeball or just a random accident. No one else gets hit in, the, hit in the face but that person. They are just prone for these types of injuries. Well, the enemy is just like that. The enemy is constantly in position to be destroyed by God. Constantly. The enemy cannot get out of that position. The enemy is always in a position to be defeated by God. I want you to look closely at what Rahab says. This is profound. Rahab says, we know what the God that you serve has done for you in the past. You went through the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea. This was Moses. And then once you got across, you destroyed the Amorites. So there's a body of water that you get through, and then a people group is destroyed because they, ri- they, they rose up against you, and you destroyed them. All right? So you follow that logic. Jericho was in the exact same position. Rahab realized there's a river right there. There's a body of water. And once you get through, we're the first ones that you're going to encounter here. And we're going to try to rise up against you, and the same thing's going to happen. We're going to be destroyed. As in... We are positioned just like the past people that you destroyed. Why? Because the enemy is always positioned to be defeated by God. Rahab saw this. We are the enemy of Israel. Therefore, we will always be in a position to be defeated by God. You see, the story of God conquering his enemies is on repeat all throughout Scripture. It just happens over and over and over again. And if the enemy's always in position to be defeated by God, then what is the moving piece? It's us. God is waiting for us to get into position. He's waiting for us to get on the edge of the Jordan River and saying, let's go, because God said to move forward. The enemy doesn't have to move. 
The enemy's already in position. It's our job to get in position, to be used by God, to go in and take what God said is ours. Do you know that the, the addiction that you have is always ready to be defeated? It's always ready to be defeated. God's waiting for you to say, I'm ready to get this out of my life now. I'm ready to partner with God and get this thing out of my life. Your anger problem is always ready to be conquered. It's always ready to be defeated. But are you ready to conquer it with God? Getting on a macro scale, human trafficking, if you've seen the, the movie Sound of Freedom, I haven't seen it yet, but it's shed a lot of light on human trafficking and what's happening in the world right now. Here's the good news. Human trafficking is always in a position to be defeated by God, but he's waiting for people, people groups, individuals, churches to rise up and say, we're going to join the fight against something that is from the pit of hell. The enemy is always in a position to be defeated. God's just waiting for us to get in position to be used by him. And you know what else Rahab did? Rahab said, speaking on behalf of all the people in, in uh, Jericho, they knew the name of the Israelites. They knew who the Israelites were by name. They knew the things that they had done. They knew the whole story of Israel and how God had fought on their behalf. Did you know that the enemy should know your name? And the enemy should know our name as a church, as Access Church. Going all the way into the New Testament, you don't need to go there, but there's a story of uh, a group of, of sons called the Seven Sons of Sceva, and they had heard about Jesus and how Jesus was casting out demons. And that was a common practice, by the way, in ancient times was, uh, was basically magic and stuff, and they would, they would try to exercise power over other evil spirits. This was a common thing. And so they, they saw and they heard stories of this man named Jesus and how he was casting out demons everywhere that he went. So they thought, we're going to try to use the name of Jesus over, over demonic spirits and evil spirits that we encounter. So they started doing it, and it seems like they actually had some success casting out demons until one day they go to cast out a demon, and the demon responds to them, Jesus I know, and then catch this, and Paul I know about, but who are you? So the demon not only knew Jesus' name, which you would say, of course the demons know Jesus' name, but the demon knew Paul's name as well. Because Paul was also operating the authority of Jesus Christ and also casting out demons. And so what happened? The demons in the spiritual realm, they knew about this dude named Paul. They're like, hey, be careful of Paul because he walks in the power of Jesus and he'll be able to cast you out too. Because when we stand up and do something for God, the enemy takes notice. And the enemy knows our name. And that's what happened with Rahab and Jericho. They're like, we know these people that are coming towards us right now. We know their reputation. We know their name. And we know what's going to happen when they get here. The enemy should know your name and the enemy should know our name here in Glen Ellen. The enemy should know the name of Access Church here in Glen Ellen. They should know that when people come here, they get, they get freed from the addictions that they've been baking on to hold these people in hostage for the rest of their life. But when they come here, it breaks free. They should know the name of Access Church in the demonic realm. Because when people come here, they get set free. This is a fight not against flesh and blood. This is a fight against principalities and spiritual powers in high places. That's why they need to know our name. I heard somebody say at Bethel, and I love that. I forgot the name of the, I wish I could find the pastor's name. I looked him up, but I couldn't find it. But this is what he said. This was like his tagline. He says, I want to be known in hell and in heaven, and everything else in between doesn't matter to me. That's what he said. I want to be known in hell and in heaven, and everything else in between doesn't matter to me. My popularity, my reputation doesn't matter to me. I want to put the enemy on notice, and I want heaven celebrating every time I go out to fight the enemy of darkness. Amen? So the enemy melts in fear, awaiting their destruction. And then we go on, and we see the last thing that happens. Sorry, I've lost my place here. Oh, so although, uh, although Rahab was speaking on behalf of the people of Jericho, as I mentioned, Rahab was not Israel's enemy. It was the, the king of Jericho that actually was the enemy that was, that was rising up, that wanted to know what the spies were doing. And uh, as I mentioned, Rahab lies. 
She lies to the king of Jericho, and then she cuts a deal with the spies. And this is kudos to Rahab. Kudos to Rahab for being a forward thinker, for being creative on, on her feet. She strikes a deal with them, and she says to the spies, when you come back to destroy Jericho, I want you to preserve me and my family, my entire household. And she says this, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Do you realize that in this moment, Rahab actually displays faith in God. She makes a confession of faith about who Yahweh is. She says he's God in heaven and God here on the earth. And even later in the New Testament, it's amazing how the the New Testament correlates with these stories showing it hundreds of years later. James says in in chapter 2, 25, in the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Rahab shows us faith. Do you know what Rahab did? She melted in fear as well. But this was actually a good fear because Rahab was melting in the fear of the Lord. Do you know that there, there comes a, a point in our life, and it should happen many times, when you and I melt in the fear of the Lord? I know that sounds like it's a bad thing, but it's actually not a bad thing at all. The fear of the Lord is a good thing. The book of Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. The fear of the Lord is a good thing. Now, if any of you have ever seen something melt or you've melted something yourself, what does something that melts, what, where does it go automatically? It will always obey gravity. It will begin to sink down. If you melt a candle, it will begin to melt downward, a cram- whatever it is. It will always melt downward. Why is that? Because it becomes obedient to the law of gravity at that point. And the same thing happens to us when we melt in the fear of the Lord. You know what we do? We become obedient, and we begin to bow down. And that's what Rahab was doing, is in the fear of the Lord, she was becoming obedient, and she was beginning to bow her knee to the God of heaven and the God of earth. Because when something before it melts, what it has is a structure that resists gravity. It has a a structure that pushes back on gravity saying, go down, go down, and it's pushing back saying, no, no, no. But then when the fear of the Lord comes in, when the fear of the Lord comes in and melts that that objection that we have, that rebellion that we have that doesn't want to bow our knee to God, it gets to a point where the fear of the Lord is so strong on us that we begin to bow down and bow our knee to the Lord. Rahab was bowing her knee to Yahweh. And all throughout Scripture, this is what we see the fear of the Lord doing. I'm just going to reference a few because I want you to see how this, this shows up. When Jesus is about to get arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and the, the, the crowd comes up, if you remember, they ask Jesus, I forgot what the prompting line is, but Jesus rep- responds to them. He says, I am he. And it says they fall to the ground. They fall face first to the ground. Why? Because the fear of the Lord was there. The truth of who he was was there and they couldn't help but hit the ground. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel has a vision, an open vision of the God of heaven. You know what happens? He fell face down. Daniel has a vision on the side of a riverbed. And it says that he fell into a deep sleep with his face to the ground. Where the angel had to actually tell him to stand up before he could speak to him. Because he fell face down to the ground. The woman who washed the feet of Jesus with her tears, what did she do? It says that she was kneeling down to do it. Because the fear of the Lord will push us down in submission to the God of heaven and the God of earth. Would you stand with me for a moment? I hope that you have not reached the melting point where you think that God is against you. I sure hope that you are walking with God in a way that your enemy is melting in fear because the enemy's always positioned for destruction. And when the enemy sees us get in position, that's when it gets really, really hot for them. (laughs) 
But I, got a que- I have a question for you all today is, have you reached the point where you've melted in the fear of the Lord yet? This is not just a one-time thing. Yes, it happens when we first submit our lives to the Lordship of Jesus, and we say, you are Lord, and I am not. But Paul says in Philippians, he says that one day, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. Everyone one day is going to reach that melting point where they bow their knee. But we have the opportunity to do it before that time comes. They're not going to have an option at that point. But you and I, we have an option now. We have an option to say, I'm going to submit myself to Christ.